When people talk about volatility, it's usually seen as negative, a destroyer of wealth. In this video, we'll look at how we can turn that on its head and see three ways to turn volatility into a way of increasing your returns. This video is sponsored by Saxo, an award-winning UK investment platform. Beside me, you can see a table of volatilities for various investments. This is a typical annual percentage price move for these investments. So you shouldn't be at all surprised if the price of one of these investments moves up by its volatility. That's what typical means. So for example, for cryptocurrency, a 70% one year move is absolutely normal. Whereas for a money market fund, you'd expect a less than 1% annual price move to be normal. Generally, you'd expect equities to be more volatile, they're further up on the table than fixed income. Bonds tend to be less volatile investments, depending on their duration. But generally, when you see these tables of volatility, it's described as a bad thing, something to be avoided or diversified away. Whereas in fact, you can make money out of volatility. Now you probably remember at school you were taught about something called standard deviation. What if I told you that standard deviation or volatility as we call it in finance is something that you can buy and sell? Well, that's the way it is. If you trade derivatives, you can actually buy and sell volatility and the time you choose to sell it is when it's expensive. Now for a professional investor, they can sell volatility via selling options directly. However, for most retail investors, certainly in the UK, that's not possible. So what we can do instead is to buy a fund which sells options. And that way we can pocket the premium from selling those options and boost our income. So let's look at some of these funds where you can sell volatility. Now this is generally called a yield enhancement strategy because by selling something, you're boosting your income. So the fund manager will take an index, say the S&P 500, and then they'll sell options on that index They'll sell the upside, for example, with a call option to somebody else and they'll pocket the premium, which is then passed on to their investors in the form of a dividend. Now, at the same time as selling the upside, you actually buy the index itself. So what you end up with is something that looks like a hockey stick where the upside is capped and you keep all of the downside. And that's called a buy right. You've bought an index and you've sold the upside. Now, you might be thinking that sounds really toxic. I've sold the upside, I've kept all the downside. The reason why you do it, of course, is because of that income. And that's why if you compare the payoff, as you can see beside me here, with just buying the index, it's kind of shifted upwards by that premium. Now, options come with an expiry date, which means that the fund manager will have to regularly sell them, usually monthly, and then that generates your monthly dividend. Now this buy right strategy, you buy the index and write an option or sell an option, has an index in the United States called the buy right index for the S&P 500. And this allows you to backtest the strategy, at least theoretically, going all the way back to 1988. So what I've got here is a comparison between a total return index for the S&P 500 versus its buy right index, where you're continually selling the upside and pocketing the income that's generated. In the bottom panel, I've divided the buy right index, BXM, by the S&P 500's total return. Notice that for a very long period of time, from 1988 all the way up to 2010, the two were roughly in line with each other. However, after 2010, there was a very marked underperformance of this buy right strategy. The reason for that is because there were such incredible capital gains for the S&P. Remember what we've done with the buy right is to sell the upside to someone else. So the worst possible environment for a buy right strategy is when you've got a very rapidly increasing underlying index. Now this strategy has become very popular recently because presumably people are thinking, well, the United States is looking very toppy, very overvalued. So I think it'll probably ease off on its capital growth for a while and it'll remain volatile. That's the key thing, which means that selling the options will give me a very high coupon while still being exposed to the S&P. So if we look at that same data, but we look at returns annually, and here you can see the S&P returns on the x-axis and the buy right strategy on the y-axis. 
the line of identity is the dashed yellow line, and I've highlighted the years in which the buy right strategy underperformed in red and the ones where it outperformed in blue. Notice that the blue years, when the buy right strategy outperformed, was when the index was either trending upwards slightly or sideways or downwards, because that's when the income tends to soften the blow. The years when it gave the greatest underperformance was when the S&P 500 had its highest returns, and that's because of the fact we've sold the upside. So you can see the attractiveness of this buy right strategy right now. People don't believe in the upside as much as they did for the S&P or maybe even the Nasdaq, so they're quite happy to sell that upside to somebody else and pocket the premium today. Now in the UK, you can buy buy right funds, ETFs, and these are from GlobalX, for example. This is not a recommendation, of course, but you can see the attractiveness here because for the NASDAQ index, which is very volatile, the current dividend yield for this fund, QYLD, the sterling denominated version is QYLP, the dividend is 12.2%, which is very high and a very attractive yield. For the S&P, which isn't quite as volatile, the current dividend yield is about 9.7%, but still much higher than you'd get simply by buying the S&P. So both of these ETFs have a version which ends in P because it's sterling denominated. That's QYLP and XYLP. Now there are also active funds which use this option selling strategy to enhance income. For example, a very popular one in the US, and this is run by JP Morgan Asset Management, is called JEPI, the ticker is J-E-P-I, and this is actively managed. The idea here is that JP Morgan selects stocks, it buys those stocks in the S&P 500, which it thinks have the greatest upside potential, and at the same time, it sells call options on the ones which it doesn't think are going to go up as much, or which are very volatile. Remember, that's what gives the highest option premium if a stock is very volatile. In fact, the US is spoiled for choice because it has 307 ETFs, buy right ETFs listed on Vetify. I've just shown the top 10 here in terms of assets under management. And you can see QYLD and XYLD there as well. So you can certainly enhance your income by using these buy right strategies and buying a fund which implements them. However, as always, if you don't understand it, don't buy it. Today's video is sponsored by Saxo. If you're an investor looking for a premium investment experience without premium prices, Saxo has revamped its fee structure and platforms to give you better value and more control. UK investors enjoy commissions of just £3 per UK trade and $1 per US trade. Plus, Saxo charges no custody or platform fees, and currency conversion fees are just 0.25%. Saxo Trader Go is for everyone, offering intuitive tools and extensive charts, while Saxo Trader Pro is designed for the pros, featuring advanced features like algorithmic orders and multi screen setups. Integrate third party tools or use Saxo's APIs for an even more tailored experience. With access to over 70,000 instruments globally, including stocks, ETFs, bonds, Forex, and more, your investment opportunities are endless. Diversify with funds and ETFs, and make informed decisions with Saxo's in-depth market analysis and educational resources. Saxo is ideal for experienced and high net worth investors, offering sophisticated tools and tiered benefits. As a viewer of Pension Craft, Saxo is offering you an exclusive welcome bonus. Open an account and receive up to £200 back on online trading fees to help you get started. This offer is valid for a period of three months after your first trade. This offer cannot be used for FX, FX options, CFD, CFD options and CFD indices. To learn more, just go to the link in the description below. The second thing you can do to monetize volatility is simply to carry on saving and investing. And that's particularly true if you're early in your savings journey. And that's because early on, volatility is much less important than it is when you've got a large amount of savings. Let's illustrate that with a really simple example where we've got a 30 year investment period. Every year we get 6% return steadily, except for one awful year. And that awful year happens either at the beginning of our investment period or at the end of it. 
Now the compounded returns are identical in these two scenarios. 6% for 29 years and one year with a 30% fall. But because we have less savings when we start off, a 30% crash really doesn't matter that much. Of course, we'll underperform until we get to the end of the period. However, the crash at the end of the period is really much more destructive of wealth because we've got more wealth. This is often why people de-risk just before retirement to avoid this, and it's called sequencing risk. But what sequencing risk means for saving is that volatility at the beginning of your investment journey matters a lot less than volatility at the end of it. And there's another reason why a crash in the beginning or in the mid part of your savings journey is really helpful. In fact, you should be kind of hoping for it. And that's because valuation really matters for return. This is a report from Vanguard. You often see these graphs shown, but this is just one example of it which looks at the starting price to earnings multiple for US stocks and for international stocks, and then it tracks the returns over the following decade. Notice how when valuations are high, the subsequent returns are low because you've overpaid for stock, whereas if you buy stock when they're cheap, the long-term returns tend to be higher. The point they were making in this Vanguard research note was that international stocks were cheaper than US stocks, so you'd expect a higher return for them. But equally, if you're someone who's, say, in your 20s, 30s, even your 40s, and markets have crashed, then you're buying stocks as you save and invest at a much lower multiple, and that means higher returns long term. So this is another reason why during periods of market volatility, when there's a crash, then it's usually a good idea to carry on investing. In fact, if you possibly can, you'd actually save more. And our final way of profiting from market volatility is related to the previous one, and that's rebalancing. The idea here is that you have some long-term allocation in your portfolio. To put it at its simplest, it could be 60% stocks, 40% bonds. And then when you deviate from that because stocks have rallied and bonds haven't, then once you reach a certain deviation distance from your target weights, so you started off at 60-40, and now you're 70, 30, then you rebalance. You sell some stocks which have risen and you buy some bonds which haven't, which on the face of it seems like a very odd thing to do. You're selling your winners and buying your losers. But back tests show that this strategy actually works reasonably well. So here's a simple example of how that would work in practice if we've got a 60, 40 portfolio. In the top panel, the red line shows you cumulative stock returns the blue line is cumulative bond returns, and then our 60-40 strategy portfolio is shown in yellow. Now in the bottom panel, what I've done is I've shown you what proportion of the portfolio is invested in stocks. Notice how that doesn't stay constant because we're not continually rebalancing. What we're doing is just waiting until our stocks touch some kind of threshold. If they go up to 70% stocks, 30% bonds because they've rallied, then we'd sell some stocks and that takes us straight back to 60%. And if stocks fall in value such that the allocation falls to 50% stocks, 50% bonds, then we buy some stocks. So again, we snap back to that 60% allocation. So the dashed white lines that you can see here are when those allocations occurred. The first one occurred in 2008 when equity markets tanked in the US, equities fell, the allocation to equity fell as well, then it touched that 50% mark and we sold some bonds to buy equity. And that makes good sense because stocks were then very cheap. It was an incredible opportunity. But then what happened was a very sharp rally in equity, which we bought cheaply. And you can see that then we touched the 70% boundary. So at that point, we sell some stocks and we buy some bonds. We bag some of our profits, in other words. And in fact, all of the rebalancings that happened after that were during the stock market rallies. And what they involved was selling equity to buy some bonds. Now, there's been quite a lot of research published on whether it's worthwhile rebalancing. And the general result is, yes, it is. And it doesn't make a huge difference. But generally, if you do it infrequently, because it's an effort, and it also sometimes incurs trading costs or capital gains tax realizations if it's outside a tax-sheltered account, then it tends to outperform. 
So for example, here's a research note by T. Rowe Price, and you can see that the outperformance based on the allocation of the portfolio, and here we've got a 30%, 60%, and 90% equity portfolio, the rebalancing pays off, although the differences are not huge. So for example, for the 30% equity portfolio, if you use these fixed bands where you deviate, say, 3% from your target allocation, then the difference in mean return is not huge. It's between 5.57% and 5.52% without rebalancing. In bear markets, you can see the difference is bigger. So there it's 5.72 and 5.32. So really, it's during these periods of really large market moves where these rebalancings can actually add a bit of return to your portfolio. So those are three ways in which I think you can actually make money out of volatility. And I think having a market crash shopping list, which is another video I make about volatile periods, is a good way to make use of these sell-offs to buy the stuff you really want and also buy them at bargain prices. Now, don't forget our offer from Saxo. They're offering a welcome bonus for Pension Craft viewers, which is worth up to £200 back on your online trading fees. But of course, terms and conditions apply. And if you want to learn more about that, you'll find more details in the link below. And as always, thank you for listening.